Uh, so today I'm going to talk about machine learning for theorem proving. But before moving into the machine learning aspect, let's go over some basics with respect to theorem proving. So theorem proving is essentially what it sounds like. You state a theorem, and then you try and prove it. Uh, we did this all the time in our math courses long ago, where, for example, a theorem could be that addition is associative. Or we can write it out a little more explicitly to capture what we mean by associativity. Looking at this, we can immediately think, hey, this is true by basic algebra, or this is trivial, trivially true. Um, I don't need to write a proof. You've already convinced yourself that it is true. But at some point, you were probably forced to put pen to paper and write out maybe a proof by induction, which then feels like you've made you know, a rigorous case for correctness. But even still, and maybe the chalkboard-like font is a dead giveaway, this is what we consider informal theorem proving. To do this in a formal way, we can do it programmatically, where we define the natural numbers inductively and define addition, and then state the theorem and write a programmatic proof. And you could do all of this in something called a proof assistant, such as Koch, Isabel, or Lean, which allow users to perform interactive theorem proving, where they state a theorem, prove it, and the proof is machine checked for correctness. So how do these proof assistants work? Well, there are entire summer schools that cover topics like this, so I won't go too into that. All I'll say is that they typically have some logical or type theory basis, and proving a theorem in them amounts to applying rules of the formal system to transform the goal, which starts out as the theorem itself in the proof state, um, until it becomes trivial. One can try to prove the theorem directly in the proof assistant logic, but it would be a very difficult and unforgiving process. And so instead, these proof assistants provide high-level tactics like induction and reflexivity to help guide the process. So why would someone want to use a proof assistant? Proving addition is associative is pretty elementary level stuff and not particularly interesting. Well, two popular applications include formalizing mathematics and formally verifying software. To formally verify software with a proof assistant, a programmer can write their software, specify a theorem about a property of their software, and attempt to prove that their code adheres to that theorem. So, for example, they can define a list data structure and write functions on lists like reverse. Then they can try um, and prove properties they'd want to be true about the behavior of the reverse function, such as the reverse of appending two lists is the same as the reverse of the second list concatenated with the reverse of the first list. Or maybe even a property like the reverse of the reverse of the list is the original list itself. So now I'll talk about examples that illustrate the power of formalizing math and formal software verification to motivate why you'd want to do it. Formalizing mathematics has gained some popularity among mathematicians in recent years as it can help provide more rigor to math. The proofs are easily checked, which can be an incredibly difficult thing for humans to do on their own. And some even envision a future where every proof submitted to a math journal is accompanied by a formal proof. A recent success story in this space includes the liquid tensor experiment, where Schultz presented a challenge online to formalize a theorem about condensed real vector spaces. And Kamalin and his team rose to the challenge. Much of undergraduate math has already been formalized in the Lean Proof Assistant in what's called the MathLib library. And so that formal foundation allowed for the formalization of this complex theorem about complex objects. On the other hand, with formal verification using proof assistance, it has been shown to actually work in terms of producing better quality software, which is something that I think we can all get on board with. Bugs in software are bad, right? 
For example, in 2011, a project called CSmith tested three C compilers, the Cock Verified C compiler, Comcert, and two industry standard compilers, GCC and LLVM, which I'm sure you're all somewhat familiar with. And the project found that Comcert was the only one for which CSmith could not find any wrong code errors, so no bugs, which is a pretty cool result. So while formal verification does not guarantee the absence of bugs, the process of deeply thinking about your code and specs and proofs enables more bug-free code, as opposed to, say, just writing some test cases. And somewhat predictably, even with the help of an interactive theater prover, the effort required to write proofs is often prohibitive. For software verification, verifying code requires a lot of time and a lot of proofs in relation to your code. For example, for the Cock Verified C compiler Compcert, the proof is more than eight times bigger than the compiler code itself and took three person years of work. Similarly, to verify an OS microkernel in Isabel, it took 11 person years to write the proof script. So as a general rule, because of the great expense of verification, virtually all software that companies ship today is unverified. And the triumph of that liquid tensor experiment took place over the course of two years, where the effort was split into two parts, since it was too difficult to prove the theorem directly. Um, here are the dependency graphs of each part, where part one involved proving a theorem, and part two involved proving that that theorem implied the original desired theorem. So no easy feat. But how do we as programmers typically deal with hard things. Well, we try to automate them. So with respect to the software development pipeline, there are a lot of access, aspects that could be helped with some automation, and similarly for the formalization of mathematics. But for the purposes of this talk, we'll mostly focus on how we can automate proof writing, which as evaluated now on large scale benchmarks, assumes that you did most of, if not all of the process beforehand, perfectly, which is not always a great assumption to make. Right? <laughs> so I'll first provide background on what it's like to write proofs in the theorem proving environment without automation techniques. Then I'll talk about automation techniques that have been integrated into the proving environment uh, before moving on to how um, machine learning can be used to model the human interaction with the proof assistant. So imagine a programmer has opted to use the cock proof assistant and wants to write a proof script in order to prove some theorem, here called spec, um, maybe even a property about some software. Using the lean and Isabel proof assistant would be a similar experience, just kind of different tactic names. Um, so after specifying the theorem, they begin with the proof tactic. As a response, cock provides feedback which is the current proof state. This is a simplified view for purposes of the example. It obviously does not look like your iPhone messaging or something. Um, in this case, there is one sub goal, which is the theorem itself and is yet to be proven. The programmer can examine the proof state and think critically about it before applying more proof tactics to guide cock in solving the goal. Here we can see the goal exists for all n, and so the programmer can assume the existence of some arbitrary n and apply the intro tactic to eliminate the for all quantifier. Now we see that the natural number n is in the local context of assumptions. So let's say the programmer wants to use some, let's say, induction. That would make it so they have two goals to solve, the base case and the inductive case. The programmer can continue applying tactics to solve the goals until eventually there are no more goals left so they can apply QED and have proven the theorem. This back and forth helps guide the programmer in finding a proof, but you can imagine with very complex proofs, it can be quite taxing. So there are tools that can be integrated into these proof assistants, um, and there are other languages entirely that use constraint solver-based proof automation. In fact, we'll see later on that tools called hammers can be complementary and even be int integral in a machine learning approach. Um, hammers call out to SMT solvers when attempting to hammer out a proof. They try to construct the proof in their logic, and if successful, it gets translated back into the logic of the proof assistant. 
However, they cannot reason um, about proof approaches such as induction and struggle with higher order logic. So while powerful at times where, for example, about one fourth of a cock benchmark um, can be solved by just invoking the hammer, their power is greatly limited. Lim limited sorry. And so ML-based tools are important for theorem proving because they let us go beyond these first order solvers and continue to push on what is possible in terms of automating the proof writing process. ML-based tools can prove over, um, for example, one third of Koch uh, benchmark theorems. So while improvements at times can seem incremental, it is potentially a lot of effort saved. But if all this was not convincing enough, another thing to note is that theorem proving um, is also important for advancing AI. Um, as you kind of heard earlier, we're in the middle of an LLM craze where they've been shown to have um, pretty incredible capabilities on a wide range of tasks. Namely, LLMs have shown that they are capable on very hard problems such as generating code and have demonstrated mathematical reasoning abilities, especially with specialized math LLMs which have been trained to solve quantitative reasoning problems such as this one. But while LLMs produce good answers, the challenge with them is that they also produce well-formed, convincing, wrong answers. For example, you could try testing the LLM-generated code, but passing tests still might not be indicative of correctness. This makes it difficult in most domains to use LLMs reliably and makes it difficult to trust their output. But proof assistants could offer a solution to this challenge. Remember, they act as an oracle to machine check a proof. If LLMs generate convincing looking but wrong answers and you have a way to formalize that output and write a proof, the theorem prover can identify and flag those wrong answers. Same goes for when generating many candidate proofs, it'll only accept the valid proofs. This makes theorem proving a very powerful domain for LLM use and maybe can serve as a domain in which we evaluate LLM reasoning capabilities overall. But the rest of this talk will be dedicated to how to use machine learning for automating theorem proving. So um, here's kind of an outline of what's to come. Um, first, I'll kind of cover the fundamentals of um, ML for theorem proving um, and an example that kind of puts together these um, fundamentals. Then I'll kind of look into some ways people have thought about going beyond this, um, kind of thinking about is there a best way to do it? Um, and how other parts of that you know, pipeline process I showed earlier fit in. Um, and especially where does the human fit in, right? They're the ones having to prove theorems. <laughs> so yeah, let's get started. So existing work has built models that perform next tactic prediction or even whole proof prediction to synthesize proofs. Typically, these models take as input the theorem, current proof state, and some contextual information and predict the next likely step of the proof. So typically, you could sample the top k, or here, three tactics, and then use the proof assistant to check the candidate proofs that arise from applying those next tactics. The proof assistant provides feedback in the form of the updated proof state and displays whether there are any errors. So again, this whole interactive um, nature. So for the ones that do not result in an error um, or a repeated proof state, we continue to give them as input to the model to generate the next steps. If the state shows that there are you know, no more goals to be proven, then we have successfully proven the theorem. So to give a different view, here is the start of our search tree where the nodes are states resulting from tactic applications and the arrows are tactics. So in a what's called a meta-heuristic search, the model is biasing the search towards the likely next steps. So it could be depth first search, breadth first search, whatever. And we continue the search until one of our candidate proof scripts has no more goals left to be proven and we can predict QED. So this approach greatly depends on how good the model itself is, right? It's the one guiding the search. So one way to try and get a good model is to get high quality um, data for training. So this training data could come in the form of other people's experiences with proving theorems. So for three, uh, the, for the three proof systems that I mentioned, 
um, earlier, Isabel, Koch, and Lane, there are publicly available data in the range of 100 to 300,000 theorems, um, and there are associated human-written proofs um, for each of these um, proof assistants. However, different theorem provers have different communities backing them, which contributes to uh, what kind of data is available for each. For example, Lean has a lot of excitement for the math community um, and active participation of notable mathematicians, so they have a lot of formalized math there. Uh, Koch, on the other end, is a popular choice for software verification. Um, and so whichever proof system a researcher decides to pursue in training you know, a model for, um, it can sometimes limit the comparisons to prior work as they are kind of stuck with the data and that proof environment for that prover. Um, though there are um, some recent efforts um, to have benchmarks that go across different languages, so to allow for more of these comparisons. So once you've chosen a proof, chosen a proof assistant, uh, you, can you typically want to generate examples so that you can train your machine learning model in a supervised manner. So looking at the MathLib4 library from Lane, let's say this is a theorem and it's human written proof from that library. So the corresponding training example um, could just be the theorem as input and the entire proof as target. However, by doing this, you may miss out on the intermediate state to learn from. So typically, researchers extract data by running the human written proofs step by step and aligning the current state and the next tactic applied by the human. Thus, since most proofs are often more than one step, the number of training examples is more than double the number of theorems um, for the MathLib library if you were to kind of perform a data extraction on that. So going back to example creation, we know that there is other information available in the proofing environment that could be useful for modeling. For example, if you can see there um, in the target part of the sequence, add a SOC and add com, com so add, uh, additive associativity, additive community, are lemmas in the target. Um, and so without providing them as input, the model would have to hallucinate their existence, right? So already proven lemmas and logical facts, which are sometimes called premises, are useful to include in the input. Uh, we could use the ground truth positive premises at training time, but at test time, we need a way of retrieving useful premises. So premise retrieval can be done either using sparse or dense passage retrieval techniques. Um, since retrieval will be covered in a later talk today, I won't spend too much time on this, but just provide the intuition. Uh, which is that there could be thousands of premises currently available in the proving environment just by simply importing different libraries. And so for the given proof state, you want to retrieve premises that are most useful for, the, for, for that proof state. Um, you can train an encoder on positive and negative premises, encode all your premises, and encode the proof state, and choose the ones that have the maximum cosine similarity to serve as input to your model. Um, other work has additionally explored training um, what's called like a re-ranker model, um, since it is important to prioritize uh, which of these premises make it into the input, as you also have sometimes limited space. Another thing that goes into making a good model is uh, suitable architecture to represent the different facets of the proving environment, namely the proof state, premises, um, and maybe even the proof up to the current point that you're working at. So, Early work started with RNNs. Other work used the underlying abstract syntax tree representation of the proof state, and so used um, tree LSTMs in order to represent that. Um, even recent work has used uh, GNNs, since the relationship between different definitions and lemmas can be represented by a graph. Remember that large dependency graph from earlier, right? But most obviously explored uh, as recently are um, transformers, specifically transformer-based pre-trained LLMs, so just kind of another um, example of how theorem proving is a, is a good domain for LLM use and is becoming very popular for that. So once we have a model, um, how do we use it to search through the space of possible proofs? So recall our search tree. It can quickly become unwieldy. Um, thus, uh, naive breadth-first search is kind of infeasible to find deep proofs, and some 
prioritization criteria is required in order to balance you know, breadth and depth of this tree. So um, that's the best first search method. Um, is useful for um, prioritizing which nodes of the tree to expand. So we want to choose most promising unexplored state to expand. So here, for example, are the unexplored nodes. Um, and in a simple best first search implementation, we can use accumulated scores along the path um, from the tactic generator. So for each prediction, we can get a log likelihood score from the model and then use the sum along the path as the score for that particular node. So these are kind of some of the fundamentals. And um, now I'll show um, a tool that has implemented the fundamentals in this way. Um, and hopefully, this video works. OK. So here is um, an editor, which has um, the tool Lean Copilot um, imported. And on the right. Um, is what's the kind of displays the proof state. So if you delete a tactic from one of the theorems here um, and ask um, Lean Copilot to suggest some tactics, on the right, it'll have some suggestions of, okay, try this one out. And we see, okay, great, this one actually works and there are no more goals left in that, that proof. Um, alternatively, you can delete the entire proof and ask it to do that sort of search for the proof. And, oh great, it found something. Sometimes though, um, when you try and do the search, it gives you an error. It, didn't, it wasn't able to find a complete proof. So maybe instead you want to provide um, some tactics that you think would um, be good. So you maybe you know, you know some prefix of the proof that you want to provide, then you ask it to search for the rest. And oh, it did it. It was, it was able to do that. And then to kind of get like an idea of what's happening at each step, you can also um, look for premises that are useful for that proof state. So you have the proof state on the right, and then on the bottom is um, some premises that are considered relevant by the model for that proof state. And so, yeah, Lean Copilot is um, available online, I think is a, is a pretty cool tool. Um, yeah, so um, is this the only way? Do we, is this like, you know, it's been solved? Do, or um, can we go beyond this? So uh, one question we can even ask is, do we even need um, a search? So recent work has showed that we can still do well if we fine tune a large language model to predict entire proofs at once instead of in that step-by-step -step fashion and check those proofs with the proof assistant. And we can do even better if we fine tune a large language model to repair these predictions using the error information outputted by a theorem prover to try and generate a new proof. So here, the repair is not what you would typically think of a repair, like going in and editing a certain line. Instead, it's thought of as a, a complete regeneration. Um, and so conditioning the generation now on a, fire, a prior failed attempt and the error message. Um, but do we even need the fine-tuning step? These models are seemingly very good at reasoning, such that in-context learning is enough for some tasks. Plus, with different prompting frameworks, such as chain of thought, um, we often try and elicit informal reasoning from LLMs to boost their performance in a number of tasks. And informal reasoning data is the majority of what they're trained on, right? They may see some you know, examples of cock and lean proofs in their pre-training, but um, it's very small com compared to just informal reasoning in natural language. Um, and in terms of the, the math data that's available online, informal math data makes up the overwhelming majority of available math data. So why not take advantage of that? So for let's say an informal statement, generating an informal proof doesn't seem like that big of a leap for an LLM, while going from an informal to formal proof directly in one step seems like a lot can maybe get lost in that translation. Um, and oftentimes that sort of translation from informal to formal is called um, auto-formalization. 
And so recent work proposed um, an intermediate step called a formal proof sketch, where there are holes to fill in um, some of the explicit proving steps that informal reasoning tends to be kind of hand wavy about, right? And we can generate these proof sketches by curating a handful of sort of few shot um, examples. So let's see this in action. So here we have the draft sketch proof approach, which implements this technique. And um, it starts off with an LLM um, being few shot prompted to informally prove a statement. And then a uh, few shot prompted afterwards to generate formal proof sketches, which break the proof down into different sub goals. Notably, this work was done in Isabel, which can support proofs in a more declarative style, and so tend to be more human readable without having to you know, run the proof and look at the proof state. You can actually kind of, the, the proof state is actually somewhat explicitly um, shown in, um, in Isabel proof. Um, so in this way, um, the, like the proof assistant language that you're using could actually um, lend itself to um, this sort of auto-formalization technique. So maybe this sort of um, technique wouldn't work in a different proof assistant, um, as there may not be as good of an alignment of, of formal and informal. Um, and finally, to fill in the holes, um, off-the-shelf proofs such as the hammer that I mentioned earlier, um, or other ML-based, you know, those next step prediction tools um, could be applied. So this exemplifies one way in which different techniques can be used together, playing to their different strengths. And so a number of different ways um, to go about um, theorem improving were kind of shown here, um, and definitely not all of them. Um, it's kind of a fast moving area now. Um, and so it's, sometimes it can be kind of hard to tell which way is the best, especially if they're being evaluated on all, all these kind of different benchmarks and whatnot. And so um, how do we determine which is the best? And actually, to some extent, does it even matter if there's a best one? Um, well, I'm here to say maybe not, because um, so long as the approaches are proving different things, you can actually use them all together. So say, for instance, you have multiple different models for theorem proving, each conducting their own search for the pr a proof of a given theorem. When you check the outputs, even if only one is a correct proof, the proof assistant will pick that proof out every time. So your models can be trained in different ways on different data, using different features or hyperparameter values, different search procedures, whatever and you can get the most out of each of them. So theorem proving is also the perfect application for ensemble learning. But instead of casting a wide net and use models that have learned from other people's proofs, another technique in theorem proving is to use online learning in order to adapt to your particular project. And so a tool called Tactician for Coq looks at different popular online machine learning techniques such as locality, sensitive hashing forests for online approximate KNN and online random forests. So this is in an effort to better synthesize proofs for a particular project, right? And this works by selecting tactics um, to reuse that were already used in other proofs in your project. So in order for this to work, you actually have already needed to write some proofs, but uh, maybe it can help you fill in the rest of the proofs. And so um, I kind of you know, really focused on this one you know, narrow part of the process, right? Like generating the proof. But um, remember, there was a whole pipeline of things that had to happen before you got to even that step. And so with respect to this pipeline, there are other aspects that can be automated using machine learning that have been less explored, I would say, but are starting to be, which is encouraging, um, namely conjecturing. So conjecturing, um, what that kind of means is from definitions in your file, um, you can use a model to conjecture theorems that may be true and then check them through trying to either prove them um, or finding counterexamples. So there's techniques like property-based testing, which um, let you 
come up with counterexamples for um, given theorems so you don't waste your time on a proof. <laughs> and you can even attempt to conjecture useful helper lemmas that could help unstick a current proof. So most of the time, you don't even realize you need a helper lemma until you're in the midst of a proof. So current tools that are simply retrieving helper lemmas aren't taking um, you know, into account how unrealistic that might be in some situations. You might not know you need a helper lemma until you are right then and there. And so instead of retrieving, you actually have to you know, synthesize. And conjecturing can also be a means of training better models for theorem proofing, as you do not need to rely on human written training examples. So in one tool called Minimo, they perform both conjecturing and proof search with a transformer, um, where the transformer is randomly initialized. And for conjecturing, they use type-directed synthesis and constrained decoding to ensure that the conjecture theorems are valid by construction. So when a proof is found, proof search, which is done by Monte Carlo tree search, generates training data for improving the policy and value. So this is a reinforcement learning approach, right? And it also provides data to improve conjecturing, since it then knows how hard the problem was. They use this then to alternate between conjecturing and proof uh, and theorem proving, so this proof search, um, in this sort of self-improving loop. And also exploring a game-playing agent approach was um, Google's DeepMind's uh, alpha proof, um, which couples a pre-trained language model with the alpha zero reinforcement learning algorithm. So that was previously used um, to um, teach itself how to master games like chess and Go. And here we see that when they try to formalize informal, um, so blah. Here we see they are trying to formalize informal math problems, and then a solver network searches for proofs or even disproofs of, the, of these um, problems and progressively trains itself uh, via the alpha zero algorithm to solve more challenging problems. So it's kind of a similar flavor to conjecturing. We're here, um, but here you're kind of auto-formalizing. Like you have something that's informal, and maybe through the formalization process, um, it becomes untrue because you didn't formalize it correctly. But you can do it many times, and maybe some of them, some of them will be true. So um, in combination with their alpha geometry tool, it was able to actually achieve a silver medal status in the international math Olympiad problems this year, so solving four out of the six problems. So a pretty um, impressive feat of uh, automated theorem proving. So um, recall that theorems can also be analogous to software specs, right? In the end, though, only a human is the one like that's able to be the final call to determine whether that desired specification, like what the desired specification of the, the program was, right? Um, an ML tool could potentially be helpful, though, in inferring specifications from a program, which could be useful to the human as um, they check for whether that was the desired behavior that they were going for or not. And so um, I guess speaking of humans, how do they fit into all of this? So when you think about this human proof engineer that is performing these kind of like software engineering tasks, you may wonder, are they really this disciplined that they follow development steps in this order? Because I sure don't write code like this. Um, and it may comfort you to know that proof engineers, they're just like us. They also don't always write code like this. A case study found that proof engineers, as they code and write proofs, are constantly refining and refactoring the specs and making repetitive repairs. Because once, because a once working proof can break due to specifications evolving or even dependencies updating. And so, in fact, they may even start with writing the code and then only think about generating theorems later. So since this strict ordering may not always apply, then it is essential to develop machine learning based tools that integrate well into practitioners' workflow, considering how they move between each of these processes. 
And this will only be achieved by continuing to talk with proof engineers, right? We can't just kind of do research in isolation. We need to kind of do research um, with others and talking with them. And so making meaningful research progress in this area going forward, forward probably won't simply be determined by how much more of a, of a given benchmark of, of already proven theorems um, your tool can prove, um, but rather how does your tool aid the human as a co-pilot in being able to formalize math or verify their code. And so I guess speaking of co-pilots, recall the lean co-pilot tool and how it didn't really provide any feedback to help the user when it failed to find a proof automatically, which was kind of disappointing. It just said, like, can't do it. Sorry. So an example of a tool that is trying to think about what other type of feedback would be useful is called um, Proofster. And it provides a front-end web interface for proof search tools. So right now it implements um, to provide a front-end interface for a tool called Proverbot 9001 which is a machine learning based um, search, uh, proof search tool for Coq that uses RNNs, so not fancy LLMs. And so I'll show you an example of what it does and how it might help in debugging these sort of failed proof searches. So here someone wants to prove some property about lists but has admitted the, the proof itself. And so um, Proofster can then um, attempt to synthesize it. So when we ask Proofster to prove this theorem, it says, it also says, sorry, I can't do it. But it doesn't leave you empty handed. It provides um, an interactive search tree. So you can see what tactics were attempted um, in, in its proof search. So here's the, the start of the, the tree. And you can click on the little blue nodes to expand them like this. And so looking at this tree, I noticed that the proof search tried induction on different variables. But it did not induct over the right thing which is a very common failure mode of these machine learning models. So I go back and I give a hint, so in the form of that sort of prefix that we saw earlier, about what we should in, um, try inducting over, um, still leaving the rest of the proof to be completed by Proofster. And this time, Proofster is able to correctly synthesize a proof. So the main takeaway is that an interactive visualization of the proof search tree could help the programmer understand why searches fail. And so further research into visualizations of machine learning approaches and analysis of failure, failure, failure cases um, could be quite fruitful going forward. Um, yeah, so I guess um, kind of the, the main takeaways of the talk are that theorem proving is important for um, formal math and software verification. Um, and um, in turn, machine learning um, and AI is also important um, uh, for theorem proving and also the other way around, right? And so um, there are still many improvements that can be made to proof generation. I kind of omitted a lot of results here um, because they're not super impressive in terms of um, what, what is capable right now. And so it kind of leaves a lot of room for what kind of you know, new people coming into the field could, could potentially accomplish. And um, there are many improvements that still need to be considered with respect to the kind of pipeline. And there are a lot of open problems, so a lot of opportunity to work in this space. And so um, here are some uh, resources that um, folks could look at in terms of if they, they think this is maybe an interesting space to get into. Um, the first two are, um, first two things are um, tools. Um, then there's sort of these sort of intro material into learning about how to actually use a proof assistant, because it's kind of necessary in order to develop machine learning tools for them. And um, there is now a recent survey paper on um, deep learning for theorem proving and is already quickly kind of becoming um, out of date as um, there's, there's new stuff being done all the time now. Um, all right, well, I guess if anybody has any questions, I'm happy to take them. Yeah, thanks.